This is a production of Cornell University Library. Thank you. Thank you for such a gracious welcome and, and welcome to you all. It's, um, it's always nice to come up to Ithaca to get out of New York City, although I'm not quite sure why we did this in November. I think maybe September would have been nicer. But I'm delighted to be here, and I really thank you all very much for the opportunity for me to share uh, a little bit of, of, of what I found researching the book on, on pipeline politics. And while I tried to keep the material as up to date as possible, things change. And the chapter already on the Keystone XL pipeline has changed um, because two weeks ago a legal decision was made that now has stopped that pipeline from being constructed, um, which some may think is a good thing, some may think is a bad thing. You'll see where I stand um, by the end of the hour uh, for sure. And also with the two uh, climate um, um, publications that came out uh, just this week and last week. Again, things are constantly changing. In that, though, th there are several things that are constant. And what I found when I was researching the book is that the geopolitics of, of energy and gas and pipelines is phenomenal. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And what I try to do <coughs> is, is to discuss many different issues um, each one of which could actually be a book in and of itself. So let me backtrack a little, and, and, and you, you might think, well, you know, here she's written on, on cancer screening and, and uh, health care policy. You know, how, how did I fall into pipelines? And, and I asked myself that, too, when my editor at Prager Press came to me and said, how about doing a book on pipelines? The, uh, the fracking book did very well. What, what do you think? And my first reaction was, well, you know, I, I know what a pipeline is, but I'm not sure I can really write a book about it. And I said, let me think about it. And uh, did a little research, and that's when there was a whole hubbub out in uh, North Dakota and Montana with the uh, Keystone XL pipeline. And I said, you know what? I think, I think this sounds good. I think we can do it. So I said yes, and I wrote this book actually fairly quickly, uh, from start to finish, uh, t t when it was you know, actually out in, 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 in all its glory, w was one year, which is very, very quick. I hope it doesn't read that way, but uh, you know, it, 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 I wrote it quickly. Um, and what I wanted to do was to actually share with you, you know, what I found. We can have a discussion afterwards. Um, uh, there's no necessarily one right answer that's uh, available or a wrong answer. But basically, I, I think the timing is great, particularly as we start to focus on climate, as we focus on the need for more pipelines, as we focus on the need for more drilling for oil and gas, uh, as both oil and natural gas prices are probably the lowest they've been. So what, what did I find, and, and what can we talk about? Here is a nice outline of the chapters in the book. I'm going to talk about some of them, uh, some more than others. I'm certainly going to talk about the geopolitics. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, environmental justice and um, more so on pipeline safety and, and the health impact of, uh, of pipelines. And we can go from here and then, as I say, you know, uh, ha have a discussion. The, the global network of pipelines is absolutely huge. As I, I put several facts on this page here, uh, some of which you may or may not know. We're looking at oil reserves. We're looking at uh, oil consumption here. And um, the fact that uh, some of these countries are in the news for other reasons, I think it gives a greater credence to the importance of how everything seems to be interrelated here. Uh, as, as we look just, in this case, on oil and natural gas. Russia is uh, the largest oil-producing country. It surpassed Saudi Arabia and the U.S. But if you look at what's happening in the U.S., uh, we're certainly increasing up to uh, you know, the top three, for sure. Uh, certainly consumers, the U.S., we are the largest global consumer of oil. That should not be a surprise to anybody probably in this room. 
China is number two, uh, voracious appetite for, for oil. In terms of natural gas, uh, Russia again holds a quarter of the world's total gas, natural gas reserves, uh, most of which are in Siberia, which presents a challenge, obviously, from getting the product, the natural gas, from source to market. It's a rather inhospitable part of the world. How do you build a pipeline that's going to take the natural gas from its source to market? And a lot of the uh, um, Middle Eastern, Central Asian countries also have significant natural gas reserves. I had the pleasure of uh, visiting Baku, Azerbaijan, uh, and you can certainly see how this, this small little country has prospered because of its, its um, uh, proximity, actually, on its property, if you will, of natural gas. Um, um, we, we were, uh, I was at a conference there, hosted royally. It was almost like, you know, money was not an issue at all there. And probably the same in Turkmenistan, I've never been. Um, Qatar, I have been, and certainly natural gas has transformed uh, that desert country. And I think, as you see in fact seven, um, those countries produce two-thirds of the total world production of natural gas. So it's not just centralized in one area around the world, it's certainly in other parts as well. The U.S., though, is interesting. I, I have a question. The last line, um, why doesn't it include the U.S.? Because the U.S. is exporting gas, natural gas. It is in the next slide, okay? Um, I, I did it worldwide here, and then I wanted to focus on the U.S. No, thank you for the question. But for sure, we are now the leading producer of natural gas and the largest consumer of the product, again, followed by Russia, China, and Iran. So it was just a way to, to, to divide the slide up, if you will. But we are absolutely a major producer of this product. And in order, as I said, to move the product from point A to point B, we need pipelines. I go in, into detail in the book about the history of pipelines, starting, um, uh, you know, thousands of years of BC up to the present, and how people were very creative in terms of either using bamboo or, or copper or some other alloy to, to mold a pipe to bring uh, oil at that point to, to the surface and then try and transport it here. And I think uh, um, um, this part of the world is quite um, uh, pertinent to that, that, that uh, in, in Pennsylvania, um, I think it was Titusville, where they first started to, to notice that the, the, uh, the gas and oil, the oil was bubbling up and how do you capture that and move it on. So I'm not going to go into the history of, of how we got from the early pipeline to the now major pipeline, but it was, I thought, fun to research and, and certainly to learn about it. There are transmission, gathering, and distribution pipelines. They're in different sizes. These are kind of big ones and so forth. Uh, but basically, the global network, okay, is absolutely huge. Here's a picture, a graphic of the United States uh, with all the different lines crisscrossing the country. And you can see the hub, um, does this have a little pointer? It doesn't matter. You can see the hub down in Texas and Louisiana, um, you know, which certainly is known for its refineries and, and, uh, and, and producing of oil and gas. We have about 20, <laughs> 2.4 million miles of pipe that includes oil and natural gas and 72,000 miles of crude oil lines that connect the regional markets. In Canada, um, its pipeline system would extend, they say, 17 times around the earth if it was laid out end to end. So basically, these pipelines crisscross countries and move the product across the globe by various means. It could be by tanker, a ship tanker, it could be rail, um, but it seems to work. What happens, though, when one region 
relies on, let's say, oil or natural gas from one source. And the European Union is certainly a prime example of this. They are heavily dependent on natural gas and oil from Russia. And I think that placing all your eggs in one basket is probably not the best bet. But what are they to do? What are their other options? And I go into that in the book. Certainly, the, 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 it is a complicated, complex world of trying to, to, to figure out the, the pipeline politics. Um, and the interplay with economics, the interplay with the geopolitics is, is evident just about daily. Um, wars have been fight, fought over pipelines, right? Countries have become pawns, if you will, in this high stakes pipeline game. And backwater countries, if you will, have become major players all of a sudden because of the natural resources within their, their sovereign states. Um, but for the discovery of oil and gas in many of these countries, uh, they really wouldn't have, they really would not have as much global influence as they now do. But without pipelines, they're just going to drown in, this, in, in oil and natural gas. If, uh, you know, they need to transport it out. And they need to transport it out, usually over major distances. So let's focus a little bit on, on the geography of the world. Uh, I titled this From Russia with Love. I list here the three major players, uh, Gazprom, Rosneft, and Transneft. Um, and they control Russia's oil and natural gas exports, mostly in this photo you can see, to the European Union. They are, Russia is expanding, moving eastward to try and satiate the need of China for its product. Um, but basically, um, these are the major players within Russia. And Russia does flex its muscles. Slovakia, Hungary, and the Czech Republic all risk supply distribution of oil imports because of their high dependence on oil supplied through pipelines from one single supplier, and that's Russia. Greece is heavily dependent on oil from Iraq. And any fluctuations in the flow of oil or natural gas will cause gyrations on the world market. Ukraine, again, and this Ukraine uh, seems perennially to be in the news, but Ukraine is a perfect example uh, of, of putting your eggs in one basket and the geopolitics. Russia's dispute with Ukraine certainly disrupted the supplies and prices of transportation of oil and natural gas to the point where in the United Kingdom in one day the price soared by 27 percent. I mean that's remarkable. So just a little gyration can cause tremendous disruption in the world markets. Now, Ukraine absolutely depends on gas revenues from the pipelines that cross its country. Um, you can see several of them crisscrossing the country. So if there was to be an alternative route, if there was to be a disruption in the products that's being carried through the Ukraine, obviously that's going to economically hurt the country. So what Russia is planning to do, with uh, acceptance on the behalf of the European Union, is to build the Nord Stream 2 offshore pipeline. And that's going to go through the Baltic Sea to northern Germany, right? And then through pipelines throughout the European Union. Now, obviously, this is going to benefit Russia. It's going to make it easier to get uh, natural gas and so forth to the European Union without going through Ukraine, their enemy at the time. So Russia is going to benefit. The European, European Union will benefit. They're going to perhaps get a better deal on their uh, oil and gas. And the one who's really going to lose, of course, is the Ukraine. So this plays out daily. Um, and we'll see. Nord Stream 2, I believe, is, is, is still in production. Yep? Isn't it 
more dangerous to do it through the Baltic Sea or you <laughs> transport gas that way? More dangerous in terms of leaks or more dangerous in terms of costs? I, I'm sure they've done, well, yeah, we have many pipelines that go underwater. Um, they've done their due diligence and they've decided that be it, what be it as it is, that that's what they're going to do. Um, don't forget, in Norway, off the coast of Norway, you have a gazillion pipelines that run under the North Sea. Um, so it, it is engineering, from an engineering perspective, it's possible. So that's what they're, they are definitely going ahead with this. So Russia supplies the European Union, and basically, um, there, as I said, within the European countries, um, Scotland benefited from North Sea oil and gas. Norway, for sure, has benefited substantially by its rich deposits of oil and mostly natural gas. And the pipeline, to get that from the North Sea, wherever, if you extended the pipeline, um, Norwegian pipeline, it would extend from Oslo to Bangkok. That's how big it is. Okay, Norway supplies a quarter of Europe's natural gas needs, but it's Russia that provides the majority of it. So one might ask or say, well, you know, if, if Norway's sitting on such a huge deposit, why can't they get, in a sense, get it out faster and, and, and take care of the Euro European market? Um, I don't have the answer to that. We can discuss that later. But at the moment, Russia is the dominant player. So we have Russia, and then we have the Mideast. Um, and, and certainly, uh, as I say here, it's probably an understatement to say that the geopolitical realities in this region complicate matters significantly. Um, the Persian Gulf region is very rich in oil and gas, and it seems to be perennially involved in politics, religious conflicts, wars. And it has always been the epicenter for price wars and pipeline alliances. I talk about, in one of the chapters in the book, the Iran-Iraq-Syria pipeline that would have extended, note the past tense, that would have extended pipelines from Damascus to Lebanon, and then the gas would be delivered to the European Union from Lebanon. So why is this such a big deal? Well, for a lot of reasons, one of which it would snub Russia in the process, because now the European Union wouldn't be so dependent on Russian natural gas, they could get it from another source. But we have a situation in Syria. And we have a situation in a lot of countries in the region. And before Syria imploded, Assad really wanted to turn his country into a transit hub for natural gas. And basically, with Syria in shambles today, any hope of this pipeline being built is, is, is probably a, a pipe dream, at, pipe dream at, this, at this point in time. So certainly the geopolitical realities of the region complicate things. And some pundits have said or questioned whether the Syrian civil war is also a pipeline war. I don't take a stand on that, I just bring it up. But certainly, again within the region, the effort to control energy supplies, energy transports, uh, you have to take into account what Saudi Arabia is doing, you have to take into account Qatar, Turkey, all of them, the three that I just mentioned, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey, wanted to remove Assad so that they could, you know, benefit from new pipelines and cut, you know, Syria out and Russia out. But again, politics came into play. Saudi Arabia has a little uh, a dispute, shall we say, with Qatar. Qatar is the bete noir of the region. It's shunned. It's isolated. It has its natural gas. It's still selling its product, um, but basically, uh, nobody in that region wants to do business with them. Russia, as you know, is backing the Assad regime and basically, you know, is at odds with Iran, with Tehran. And then there's Yemen. 
uh, not on the map, but down below Saudi Arabia. Yemen is an is a interesting problem of many dimensions. Saudi Arabia wanted an outlet for its oil at the bottom of the uh, Saudi Peninsula. Um, they felt that Iran might blockade the Hormuz Strait, and that would be damaging to its uh, transport of, of its oil and gas. So Saudi Arabia wanted to build a pipeline through Yemen. All right. But there's a war going on. Saudi Arabia is mad at the Houthis. Um, uh, the Houthis control the Gulf of Aden. And this high stakes game is being played out daily. Um, so far, nothing's been done in terms of building the pipeline down there. It's definitely not happening at the moment. So oil, gas, politics always has sort of been bubbling, if you will, in the Mideast. Um, the uh, objective of all the uh, oil and gas rich countries is to get the product out and to sell it on the open market. Um, and to do so sometimes is complicated by disagreements and wars. Central Asia, the Central Asian countries are interesting. Um, lousy picture here, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a good one. But these countries, I call them the stands, they're all landlocked and they're all oil and gas rich. So in order to get the product anywhere, they need the pipelines. And they have a huge network um, and now they're looking to service, if you will, Asia, particularly China. So they're uh, separate from Russia uh, at this point, and it, it would uh, probably be to their advantage to try and cut into Russia's dominance of the region uh, by selling to China. So the development of the region's infrastructure um, has really taken off. And as I said earlier, some of these countries, you know, you can de describe them as backwater or, you know, not terribly important a couple of decades ago, now are very important in terms of energy, oil, and gas. Okay. I talk a lot in the book about African politics and pipelines. Uh, Africa is complicated. It's a complicated continent. And um, I'm not going to discuss it here at this point because we have other topics to talk about. I talk about Latin America. I talk about Mexico. The energy sector is certainly crucial to Mexico. Um, in Latin America, Venezuela uh, you know, is in turmoil. I guess that's the nicest way to describe what's going on in Venezuela. Um, Brazil has been uh, hampered by uh, a lot of corruption charges against Petrobras, Bras, their, their big oil company, and corruption charges against former presidents, note the plural. And basically, they're oil rich. Brazil is trying to develop its liquid natural gas uh, infrastructure. And I, I give a broad overview in, in the book um, about each of the regions. I haven't talked about the U.S. yet, but I will, I promise. In Asia, there are pipelines, of course, there too. You can see from Russia into China, Japan, Korea, and then in the lower map on the right here, what's happening in Indonesia and Malaysia. Again, these are uh, natural gas pipelines, a lot of them. Um, servicing that region. They're not global players per se, but they're mostly servicing the region. What I do want to talk about a little bit um, is the health hazards of pipelines. Um, as was mentioned, I did do a book on the uh, environmental and health impact of, of hydraulic fracturing. And, and so most of the chapters focused on what are the, what are the health hazards? you know, associated with, with all of this. Um, pipelines are different. They're not the same as oil wells or natural gas wells and so forth. But they, they obviously do have a, a potential for harm to uh, the environment and, and to human health. Uh, and I want to bring up the Enbridge Energy Line B pipeline explosion in Kalamazoo, Michigan. 
uh, which was a tremendous, tremendous disaster. Uh, it was carrying oil sands, which is heavy, it's viscous, it's toxic, it's horrible. And it, it, uh, it destroyed quite a bit of the area around Kalamazoo. And then there was the Pegasus uh, pipeline disaster in Mayflower, Arkansas, which uh, destroyed quite a bit of Lake Conway. Now, leaks happen all the time. Explosions happen less, explosions happen less frequently, but certainly are there. Blowouts, uh, these things will, uh, uh, you know, they, the, the explosions and the fires uh, will release flammable vapors and gases. Um, what happens? I mean, the, you know, the, the images of the birds covered in oil uh, are, are, are iconic whenever there's a big spill. Um, and what happens, particularly if they're carrying the heavy viscous oil sands, which are not the same as crude oil, they, they, it doesn't dissipate. It just sinks to the bottom of wherever it is and continuously pollutes the area. So it's much more uh, dangerous, in my opinion, to, to, to look at you know, transporting oil sands, and I'll talk about that in a minute, as opposed to crude oil, which has its own problems. Um, and what are the health effects? So what happens? The, the environmental risks, I mean, I show some pictures. I mean, they're for shock value and so forth to make a point. But basically, in Alberta, where there are the oil sands, the deposits, um, we have seen, based on a couple of studies, forget what's happening to the environment, but now we're beginning to see the ill effects, if you will, on health among the people that live in this region. Um, a lot of it has been underestimated according to some uh, researchers uh, because they don't take into account the evaporation from tailing ponds and dust um, and so forth. And certainly, my second point here, this has implications that need to be discussed when we debate the Keystone XL pipeline and the Dakota Access Pipeline that will go through some really gorgeous, pristine area of Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota. And I'll get to that in a minute. Let's just talk about health for a second. And as an epidemiologist, I'm well aware that trying to show associations, forget causation, but trying to show an association between X and Y is amazingly difficult, particularly when you're dealing with factors with a long latency period. In other words, you can have a spill and you can see some immediate effects of people complaining of nosebleeds or headaches or dizziness or what have you. But what are the long-term effects? And how do we determine whether the, the insult from the spill is actually you know, significantly, if you will, contributing to the, the health uh, effects that are being expressed? Um, it, it, there are many factors that have to be taken into account to determine the, what I call the strength of association between the risk factor and the disease. Let me just digress for one second, get off pipelines for one second, just to show you how difficult this is. I did a study, uh, got it published. Um, we looked at cancer incidents in southwest Pennsylvania, and it was very deliberately selected because of all the, the wells that have been drilled there. Okay, there's a lot of hydraulic fracturing going on in that particular region, particularly in certain counties compared to others, or I think they call them townships, compared to others. So what we did is we looked at the observed number of cancers that are known to be environmentally caused, bladder, thyroid, um, leukemias, and I looked at the rates in the areas in the, that had a lot of wells, and I looked at the same data in counties that did not have much drilling. And I did it before the wells went in. I started before the wells had, wells had been drilled, and then going forward. And what we found, that there was a very high, it was actually the number of observed cases 
was much higher than the number of expected cases for all the cancers. And this was true before drilling started, which made no sense. You know, if you're, you know, uh, if you're trying to show that the drilling was harmful, um, you would have expected to see a, an uptick in some of these cancers, you know, after the drilling started. Understanding that it's only been a few years and some of these cancers take a long time to develop. So I started to ask, you know, people who commissioned the study, they live in this area, I said, you know, what, what else is going on? I know you're near coal country, you know, you have coal mining, I know you had some battery factories and so forth. You know, why should we see this? What's going on? And then I did a little bit of research and I found out that um, there, um, there, there are some uh, uh, uranium tailings that were buried in, in two of these counties. And uh, a golf course was built on top of this. The child's playground was built on top of this. So you, you can't really say it's because of the drilling. You know, there was stuff going on that, that confounded and complicated things. So trying to, to figure out what the impact on health is is not easy and it will take time, particularly if you're looking at the incidence of cancers. Be that as it may, some of the short-term um, studies have shown, you know, an increase in, in, in symptoms and diseases and conditions that you wouldn't expect to see normally. So we need to monitor that and we need to see what, uh, unfortunately, they're like, you know, canaries in the mines, you know, uh, or collateral damage. We need to see what's going to happen because what's happened already happened. How do we clean it up to protect people going forward? Uh, we have a lot of toxic byproducts that are carried uh, through, through uh, pipelines and so forth. And I just list uh, four of them here. All of these can do tremendous harm to the body if you're exposed to it for great periods of time. Also, it's not just the time, but it, it's the amount, the, 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 ex, the, the, the amount of the exposure. I mean, just a little bit, you know, haphazardly is not probably going to do too much, but certainly long-term exposure at, at higher rates is, is probably not going to be so terrific for you. So let me just go back to this for a second. Um, we're, we're investigating well, not, not just me, but of many researchers looking into it, and two members in the audience are also looking at the effect on animals uh, in, in the environment. And again, what can we say about this? We can say that there's probably cause for concern, <coughs> but we can't state with statistical certainty that A, being exposed to whatever the toxins here caused B, the cancer or whatever else you're looking at. I talk about compressor stations a little bit too. Take a look at this map. Um, th these are all the compressor stations. The blue is interstate pipeline. The gray is intrastate pipeline. And the little red dots are compressor stations. Now, compressor stations are really necessary. Because basically, <clears throat> they compress the natural gas as it travels through the pipeline, and they need to do so at, at, at periodic markers. Every 40 to 70 miles, I'm told, they need another compressor station to move the stuff forward. OK, so what effect does living near one of these things have? Forget the pipeline. Assuming that the pipeline is clean and it's not going to leak, it's not going to explode, what effect does a living near a compressor station have on your health? And essentially, we're just starting to see some evidence. Um, people have uh, complained of, uh, well, I'm sure it's not minor to them, but dizziness, fatigue, you know, it's sort of soft soft uh, complaints that could be caused by a lot of different things, but they didn't exist until the pipeline was built. So, you know, we have to, to kind of take that into account and so forth. Um, and again, the number of compressor stations uh, required to move the product is going to depend on the terrain 
and, and the conditions of the, of, of the area. Um, there's a growing body of literature that, that seems to say that living near a compressor station uh, increases the risk of, of exposure to uh, VOCs, the volatile organic compounds, nitrogen oxides, noise is a big issue. Um, these things are loud, I'm told. I've, I've never actually been near a compressor station, but I'm told that they're loud. Um, sounds like a jet play, a jet taking off, people say. And basically, what has to happen with these stations is something called blowdowns, and, and, and the venting stuff, bad stuff, into the air. And this can last 20 minutes, it can last two to three hours. So again, um, we need to take into account what's happening with the compressor stations. And I know a couple of areas have, have started to mount lawsuits to prevent the uh, compressor station from being built in their neighborhood and so forth. Um, I don't know how successful they are, but you can see that quite a number of them throughout the, the Northeast, South, South Central and so forth have been built. So I talk about that in, in, in the book. But what I want to talk about a little bit is the, the politics in the United States with the Keystone XL pipeline. And I suppose this was the impetus for my getting into this uh, in the first place. In other words, there is a pipeline that exists, the red. You can see kind of squiggles there. Steel City is a big uh, uh, transit hub, it goes down. And they, the, the hypotenuse of this tri triangle is designed to move the oil sands from Alberta to Steel City and then down to Houston and Port Arthur where it will be refined. Okay. No other pipeline in the United States has generated as much fury as the Keystone XL and the Dakota Access. And basically, it's interesting in this case because you can see it crosses an international border, okay? So since it crosses an international border, final approval has to be given by the United States State Department. The Dakota pipeline, the Dakota Access, which I don't show, but it's in uh, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, that doesn't cross an international border, but it crosses interstate waterways which means that the U.S. federal government has the authority over that pipeline. So in a nutshell, proponents are saying we need the XL pipeline to be built because we don't want to be dependent on foreign oil. Now, if you remember back earlier with the, with the slides, the U.S. is, is, is pretty much oil self-sufficient, certainly natural gas self-sufficient. So we might want to you know, take issue with that. Then the proponents say, well, it's going to create jobs. Well, yes, it will, because you need people to build the pipeline, but this is going to be temporary, and most of the people who are going to be building the pipeline are going to be pulled in from other areas, and then once the pipeline is completed, they leave, and basically one estimate says maybe 35 jobs would be created uh, over the long term. Um, Opponents have a whole list of, of arguments against this thing. Uh, number one, of course, is the, uh, is the potential damage to the environment and the climate. Uh, oil sands create more greenhouse emissions than conventional oil products. More carbon is going to be released into the atmosphere, which will increase global warming. And jobs are not going to really be long-lasting. So it's not going to help people who happen to live near the route. But if you take a look at the route, there are not so many people that live there anyhow, which again raises the issue, if there is a leak, if there is a spill, how long is it going to take to get somebody into that area to uh, stop the leak and, and minimize the damage? And I talk a little bit about that in, in the book as well. The Dakota Access has different issues in that its route will cross the Standing Rock Sioux tribe's lands. And this land is held sacred by the tribe. Uh, they say it's an issue of tribal sovereignty, and the U.S. did not go through proper protocol 
to indeed get approval for this, and so it goes. Now, when I was going to give this talk two weeks ago, the timing was really pretty amazing, because on the 10th of November, a federal judge block work on this Keystone XL pipeline. And they said that basically, uh, let's see, what did he say? It was a U.S. District Court for Montana, he, and he ruled that the Trump administration failed to present a reasoned explanation for the pipeline to go forward, and that it, sim quote now, simply discarded the effect that the pipe project would have on climate change. So at the moment, th it's not going forward. The judge has blocked that. It also, the judge also found that the administration did not adequately account for how a decline in oil prices, which we are seeing, might affect the pipeline's uh, viability. So what I try to do in the book is become sort of neutral. I lay out the facts. People can come to their own conclusions and so forth. Um, the red one's there. The proposed one is the blue. That's what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. The blue. Yeah. Yeah. He said, no, can't do it. Because much of the pipeline has been completed in red, but it's the, what's at issue is that final leg, okay, um, and then going down from Cushing to, to Houston. And you need a special pipe to move oil sands. It's not the same as moving crude oil. So it's, it's terribly complicated. And I talk about it in the book. How safe are they? Mm, well, the National Transportation Safety Board has a listing of pipeline accidents. Um, it's a, it, I, I went on the site. It's, it's actually really scary. These things are, you know, they're reported by event date, uh, city and state, and, and, and the numbers will, they astounded me. I mean, this is not uh, an infrequent occurrence. So um, if you have nothing better to do over the weekend, you, you can click on that site, and it just goes, pages and pages by date, where, the extent, and so forth. Um, who's, who's supposed to be monitoring this? Well, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, is. The Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration is. And the Office of Pipeline Safety is supposed to do all this. But FERC, in particular, um, they're supposed to provide oversight on the commercial aspects of pipelines. That's what they're supposed to do. And pipelines that cross state boundaries are regulated by FERC. And as you saw from the couple of slides ago, the map, most of the pipelines cross state boundaries. Okay? It's, an, it's supposed to be an independent agency. It's supposed to not be political. But in reality, from what I could tell from my research, there is not a pipeline in existence or proposed that FERC doesn't love. They, they just, it, whatever, if you propose a pipeline, you could propose a pipeline. They'll say, sure, fine, wonderful. Um, the uh, FISMA uh, is a federal agency, and that focuses on hazardous materials and safety. They're supposed to set standards. They're a little bit better than FERC, from what I could tell. But a lot of the uh, inspections and so forth are really done by the pipeline operators, which is sort of letting the, the fox into the chicken coop kind of thing. They're, they're supposed to monitor you know, their product. Now, it's impractical. I get it. It's impractical to assume that there are never going to be any leaks, never going to be any spills, never blowouts or explosions. Um, but I think. Evidence shows that we could do a lot better in terms of monitoring safety, particularly, as you mentioned, how are they going to get under the Baltic Sea, or how are they going to you know, bring it through you know, rugged Montana uh, you know, land? How are you going to do that? Well, you need strong regulators to make sure that you're not just running roughshod over everything and hoping for the best. And I think uh, what I try to do in the book is, is to go over this and, and to present who's doing what, I give a whole timeline and so forth. Um, clearly, my impression is that we, we could and should 
do better. There was a whole to do with the Trans-Alaska pipeline. You know, people said, how are you going to do it in the tundra? You know, the, the weather's so harsh. Well, they, they, they did it. We've had leaks and so forth. Um, you know, we've certainly had leaks there. So we need to do a better job. And I'm going to end with uh, a little discussion on environmental justice. Um, historically, for decades, environmentally hazardous sites, be they toxic waste sites, landfills, and pipelines, have been disproportionately located in ethnic minority areas or low-income communities, which, of course, means that you're placing those individuals at much higher risk because of the exposure to, to these hazardous sites. Um, FERC, if, you know, has taken little action in this area. As I said, they, you know, any pipeline will get approved by them. Um, and the chapter on environmental justice focuses on some of the newer pipelines that are being proposed in the southeast, going through the Carolinas and, 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 and Georgia and so forth. And most of them, if not all, will go through areas that are you know, heavily inha inhabited by ethnic minorities and low-income populations. Um, there are supposedly laws and regulations on the books here in the United States to prevent this. But if truth be told, um, basically, this area is not really taken seriously particularly by this present administration. As a matter of fact, in 2017, the head of the EPA's environmental justice program, environmental justice is in the EPA, he resigned stating that the Trump administration and the EPA are, are hostile to environmental justice principles, and he, he, he resigned, and he has not been replaced uh, at all. So what we try and do is to try and understand. I, I mean, I'm not naive to think that that we can't ha that we, we shouldn't have pipelines. I, I you know, or I'm not naive to think that you know we're we're, we're going to be in a world without oil and gas. Um, if we have that situation, how do you make it safe? Safe for the environment and safe for people who are living cl in close proximity. To, to you know, either the drilling sites or the pipelines or the compressor stations, and essentially, um, I, I think we could do a much better job. It's not just within the United States; just within environmental justice. If you take a look at what's happening around the world, uh, Nigeria comes to mind. You know, it, it's it, these kind of principles are just trampled on. The most important thing is to get the pipeline in, get the well in, get the product out of the ground, and get it transported out. And people who live there have to fend for themselves. So I, what I try and do in my concluding thoughts uh, in, in the book is to make some sense out of all of this. And I guess there's, I, I have more questions than I, than I could answer. Um, so it's sort of, you know, an evolving, ongoing discussion of how do we get it right? And I think, and I said, uh, you know, I would declare a little bit of where I stand. I think the judge's ruling in, um, in um, Montana was quite correct because due process was not done. No one really, I mean, well, many studies were done, but the data, the findings were not taken into account. Um, and he, in my opinion, correctly stated that you have to take this into account. You can't just go ahead and do what you want because it has consequences. All of this has consequences. So I kind of had fun writing the book. I, I certainly enjoyed researching it. And why don't we have a little discussion? I think we have a little bit of time um, for your, and, and if you have any, <laughs> if you have any thoughts. Yes, my, my uh, I didn't pay her to ask all these questions, but yes, in the back. Um, I want, um, I have, sorry, I have a couple concerns. Um, one, um, you just said that the Montana um, proposed pipeline 
was blocked because of what you just said. I, I can't right. repeat it. But why did that not happen with the other pipeline? There's a, such protest to stop it. And it's mm -hmm. really sad that, that it went in. Um, so that's one thing. The, the other thing is um, I noticed in the map when you were talking about pipelines, there's a proposed pipeline from Turkey. I, I think that's the one in the Baltic Sea. I don't know. But no, that's it's, not the Baltic Sea. Oh, okay. Well, it goes over Greece, and it goes over the part of Greece where my family's from. It's very mountainous. So I don't know how they would tackle that. A lot of compressor stations, I would think. No, I know. No, I mean... They build pipelines, you know, in deserts, in tundra, mountains, under lakes, and so forth. The engineers will figure that out. But um, yeah. I, I want to I thank you for giving that overview in the beginning, especially because that is very important. Because I I really think the wars are happening because of. <coughs> the pipeline is not something that's really discussed in the news. So what you told us today was so crucial, and I thank you for that, because I didn't have a clear understanding. So seeing the maps and having you talk about that, because this is real. People are dying, and the whole Middle East, at least some parts of it, has been like to ruins. And, and when you talk about, when you just talked about Okay, if you do put a pipeline in, putting it in in a way that you're going to try 99% to make it not blow up. I mean, obviously, this, this is not happening. Um, so anyway, I, I, I Thank you. think your talk was very, very good, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, let me just uh, speak a little bit about what? I have to do another book then. Okay, no, okay. Now, let me just talk about the Dakota Access, um, which is, I think, the other pipeline you were talking about. There are lawsuits against that, too. The, 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 uh, uh, the Sioux tribe absolutely has filed uh, lawsuits. The ACLU has filed lawsuits. To, uh, you know, this is going through their sovereign land. It's quite near the, the major water supply, a major aquifer for them. You know, from an environmental perspective, you know, it, it, it almost sounds crazy. Why would, why would you, you know, run a line there kind of thing? So there are lawsuits on that one. I brought up the Keystone XL one because the judge just ruled against that. Um, so we have to see where that plays out. Um, and another question, of course, is, you know, well, why, why do we even want to bring this toxic, st toxic stuff down from Canada? We have an oil glut. The oil prices are, you know, as low as they've ever been. What, what are we doing? Um, so it looks like somebody wants to make a lot of money. Oh, well, that's always, uh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Robert. Um, I, I, I want to take issue with one thing you said. Of course you do. <laughs> I don't think it's naive to think that we should live in a world without pipelines. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, we talk about pipelines. The worst thing about a pipeline compressor station are the spills. Yeah. But living next to compressor station is probably not as bad as where you work <laughs> in New York City. And the reason I say that is that no matter what we do, if we still have transportation based on oil and gas, okay. we heat our homes with oil and gas, we're going to be <coughs> subjected to VOCs. The VOCs that you see in New York is worse than the VOCs that people see next to processing stations. So I think we have to really think about how can we move away from oil and gas sure, and sure. move to renewables. Sure. And I have several chapters, which I didn't discuss here, on energy, renewables, non-renewables, how we need to move forward on that, uh, certainly with solar, with wind. Many, I, I speak of this in the book. Many countries are, are, are using wind you know, to, uh, windmills and stuff to capture wind energy. Uh, uh, I, I do go into it. Um, and I, I also compare the safety record of pipelines to other means of transporting oil and natural gas. Um, oil tankers, they're not so wonderful. I actually have a really good, in the book, you'll see a, a, you know, a, a good graphic of that. Oil tankers are terrible. 
rail lines we know explode and do horrible things when they explode. Um, truck tankers and so forth. Well, ironically, perhaps, you know, one of the safest means of, of moving oil and gas is through pipeline compared to the other options. But I agree, I mean, you know, we should, we should definitely move toward more renewables, you know, and, and less dependence on fossil fuels. I, I mean, I'm 100% in agreement with you on that. Um, I, there are just no pipelines for solar energy, so I had to talk about pipelines. <laughs> there are pipelines, and, we, and those are the, that's the electrical grid. Yeah. And the biggest challenge about building out solar right now, particularly in New York State with our antiquated laws, yeah. is the grid. Yeah. If, we can, if we can upgrade the grid, which our laws are set in a way that we won't do it, until we change them. But we have a whole new legislature, you know? 2018 was, like, really cool. Please. Um, I, I just as a little bit of a continuation to that, could you, do you have any opinion on what you think the most likely avenue of renewable energy will be to address perhaps rolling back pipelines? Would it be, you know, increased battery technology with lithium-ion or with, you know, better solar energy and efficiency or something like that? Do you have an idea of what you think will be the, the thing that will actually transition it out? And as a follow-up to that, once that happens, how do you envision that might change the political, yeah. the geopolitical you know, tension in the world, for example, in the Middle East, where it's so dependent yeah. on that? And I'm sorry, that's a really, like... Well, yeah, no, it's a, a politically ch charged question, and I can't presume to be an expert in that particular area. My own personal opinion would be, let, let, let's try and, and, and focus on some of these, you know, renewable energy sources. So, you know, if everyone's... The proponents of all these pipelines are saying we need to be energy dependent, da da da. Well, and and, and be less reliant on on the Middle East and and so forth. Uh, well, well, you know we can do it. Um, you know, let's build up the solar panel. Thank you guys for coming very much. Greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, but politically that was never in the cards. Now it is. Ex excluding political. Laws or jurisdiction or anything like that. Do you have a prediction on what you think the most likely technology might be? Or I'm not going to make a prediction or an opinion. <laughs> opinion, yeah. That's, I'd, I'd go for solar, but you know, I'd do it that way. One more, yes. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I I guess I come from a little bit of a different background. You mentioned animals. I'm uh, more of a veterinary background with conservation medicine uh, focus in wildlife medicine, mm -hmm. um, and I'm also. I also want to say that I'm not naive in the way that I look at the world and how we're interacting with our wildlife and environment. I'm complete, I completely understand that we are a, we are a parasite on this planet. Um, there's, 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 no matter what we do, no matter how we change, how we act, we will continue to be a parasite on the planet. Maybe we have uh, you know, different ideas about maybe minimizing the impacts that we're having. So I say this because I know that you know there's this push to go towards renewable energy and wind and solar power and things like that, but I don't see um, kind of this understanding that no, mo no matter what we do, there will still be repercussions. There will still be negative impacts of what we do. So what are the repercussions? But, but to what degree? You see, everything's relative. I go into the pros and cons of, of all forms of, of energy in the book. You know, there, you know, none, none is 100 percent wonderful. Um, some are just more wonderful than others. Yeah, um, I, 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 yeah, I definitely see that for sure. But I'm just wondering that, you know, the drivers of kind of these changes are not really the people who have uh, the wildlife and the earth at heart. It's more the economic impact, or if you're able to convince the leaders that economically it's it's doable, or it should be done. Then you'll see the shift. So the people who are driving it will still be the people who try to get more of like it, it, the 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 push won't really be towards helping the planet. It's rather self enrichment. So I I just looking at it at, in a sense that I still see even in the future when we change our tactic, we will still be that uh, that negative force on the well. We may m mitigate the the disaster that that seems to be looming. Okay, if we do something, then we need to do something fairly emergent, fairly quickly. Yeah. Okay, one more. Oh, I, I, actually, I actually agree. I mean, I respect a lot of what, you're what you said. I, I think there's just a misunderstanding 
of your question in the room. Um, I think population growth is the biggest problem on the planet. I mean, because, I mean, I've been educating myself for so long about, you know, just everything, you know, global issues, environmental issues, social issues. And um, just two, three, three years ago, there, on the commons, there was a big paper mache salmon. And these people brought the salmon onto the commons to educate people what's happening up in Canada if this mining company opens up, which is the, the stuff that solar panels use. I, I, I forget what it is, but, but it just blew my mind. And I was telling someone in Ithaca who works on solar energy, and he didn't want to hear it. It's like, it's too depressing. But, but it's not, I mean, the point is we need to look at the whole picture. You know, it, because obviously the pipeline is not going to go away tomorrow, right? So, so you know, we need all the all to work on all of this stuff, whether it's green, whether it's you know, um, in, in alternative energy, you know, renewable energy or pipeline energy. I mean, so what I'm trying to say is basically, you're right. I feel at fifty at the age of fifty six, I really feel we are a parasite. And it was the New York Times that had an article just the other day. I was reading about genetically modified plants, you know, uh, the, the and how the, you know, this author was saying that the bee, that's why the bees are dying and whatnot. But one thing that struck me out of that article is that they use the word that I can't say again, but it's a world that is about humans and nothing else. Anthro, anthropono, it was like a word that, and I can't get it out of my mind because the person is right. Because that's where we're headed. Like nothing else matters but humans. So anyway, it's just it's just something I think because we're going to have an impact no matter what. And I'm not saying I'm I'm not I, I am against fracking. Okay. okay. Well, I'm glad that. We, <laughs> well, I I kind of figured that in the audience here. <laughs> but, you know, um, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm really glad that we, you know, generated, you know, such interesting discussion. Um, and, and I really appreciate, as I said in my opening remarks, the opportunity to, to, to come here to, to be with you, um, not to have snow. And, <laughs> you know, and I thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.